It's a crisis now, but homelessness also left Seattle shaken a century ago. It's been an ongoing problem. It's clear it's always been very complex since the beginning. These days, the homeless have more help, including a program that offers a hand up rather than a handout. I'm here making a livable wage, rebuilding my life, and without this program, I couldn't have done it. And an uplifting story of a Boy Scout troop out to prove everyone belongs. These stories and more next on City Street. Hello, I'm Nicole Sanchez and welcome to City Stream, coming to you from the Seattle Conservation Corps. It sits just steps from Lake Washington and for 33 years it's provided training and work skills to homeless adults. Enrollees not only get paid for a year, but also access to education, counseling and life skills. This program is just one option helping to ease homelessness in the region. Four years ago, Seattle and King County declared a state of emergency over the crisis. But a trip back in time into the Seattle Municipal Archives reveals concerns of homelessness dating back a century. Brian Callanan has the story. We need a systemic structural change to how we respond to the homelessness crisis. There are many hurdles to pass. We want to continue to build a community that reflects our values. Local leaders grappling with the challenges of homelessness. It's a story as old as Seattle itself. It's been an ongoing problem. It's clear it's always been very complex since the beginning. Anne Frantilla is city archivist for the Seattle Municipal Archives. She and reference archivist Jeannie Fisher it's Magnolia, I think. have their hands on the homeless history of Seattle. It's something that's been around for a long time and it's, it's a challenge that we've been facing for a long time. In the 1890s, about 20 years after Seattle incorporated, the city was growing and building municipal infrastructure. But problems grew too as those who couldn't afford services like water or licenses to sell goods petitioned the city for help. Some began living in shacks and shanty towns. Many concentrated in South Seattle, near the Duwamish River. It's not just a problem for the health department or just a problem for the police. Health inspectors worked to tear the shacks apart and, in many cases, burned them down. But economic instability continued to fuel Seattle's homeless crisis in the decades ahead. After the crash of 29, um, it, it's clear that homelessness started being a problem. One of the largest so-called Hoovervilles in America began growing on the tide flats of Seattle in the 30s. The city began mapping out the areas where shacks and shanty towns were growing, and comments started pouring in to City Hall. Some of the words that they're using you see echoed in what's being said today. Some people thought they were very unsanitary. The city felt a responsibility for not to spread disease and they really just wanted to get rid of them. But other people wrote, you know, stating these were the unemployed, they really couldn't find jobs, we needed to help support them. With the U.S. entering World War II in 1941, Seattle city leaders thought they'd need more property for wartime use and homeless camps became a target. The first act that the city did was to burn the first Hooverville to the ground. That was their clumsy and immoral way to attempt to push people out of sight. Allison Isinger is executive director of the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness and a history major at the UW who studied the response to homelessness in our region, both past and present. We have seen the gamut. We've seen official city actions destroying people's basic shelter, and we've seen official city actions pushed by public and community opinion to meet people's needs. Seattle and King County leaders have mapped out solutions to our homeless crisis for decades, including efforts to improve treatment of mental health and addiction issues. But Isinger says the current problem may run deeper than what local authorities can handle. 
What is going on today actually is a different kind of crisis. Eisinger says as rents have skyrocketed in Seattle in the past five years, federal social security payments to the mentally ill and other disabled people have remained about the same. There are thousands of people who really are out of options. That may seem to point towards a bleak future for the homeless, but the archives show Seattle was and is a resilient place. It's clear from our records that the city is constantly trying to solve this problem. And Eisinger says her studies lead her to believe a new, more positive cycle of history when it comes to homelessness in Seattle could be within our grasp. It is up to us, we the people, to make sure that we put into place the kinds of policies that will make things better. What shape those policies take is the challenge of Seattle's future, with a hope that there are some lessons learned from our past. To learn more about Seattle's homeless story or any other topic you'd like to explore, check out seattle.gov slash city archives. Next on City Stream, meet three men who've struggled but now have a brighter future thanks to the Conservation Corps. Welcome back to City Stream from the Seattle Conservation Corps. Since 1986, this group has helped countless homeless people find work. And now the state is recognizing the Corps as a pre-apprenticeship program. But the Corps is so much more than just helping people find jobs. It's changing lives. <laughs> yeah, I'm just leveling this out for now. Justin Perkins will graduate soon from the Seattle Conservation Corps' job program. The Corps, which is operated by Seattle Parks and Recreation, is a one-year paid work training program for homeless adults. It offers people a chance to work on their job skills while they work on improving the area. Well, I like doing this type of work because I like to do hands-on activities. And uh, it feels good to come out and uh, say, look at a park and say, yes, I did that. This has got to go down. And what a difference this program can make. Less than two years ago, Justin was in a very different place. I was uh, homeless on the streets, on drugs, and uh, today I'm here making a livable wage, rebuilding my life, and without this program, I couldn't have done it. Thanks to the Corps, Justin already has some opportunities to go into carpentry. The program is now being recognized by the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries as an apprenticeship prep program. That means adults who complete it will have even more doors open for them. There's a huge need in this region and really across the country for people to enter the skilled trades. There's a shortage of skilled workers, but in particular in our area, there's a huge shortage. So there's a giant effort to fill the pipeline into the skilled trades with apprentices. The Corps helps between 50 to 65 people at a time. They start at $16 an hour and do a wide variety of jobs, from creating rain barrels, to masonry work, to keeping parks looking tip top. And while participants work to improve the area, they're given the chance to work on their lives. Neandra Kemp spent three years in prison. Now he is part of the Corps and is turning his life around. He recently celebrated a major milestone. Last month on the 12th, I celebrated my year clean. So I've just been staying focused. Just a little bit more on this side of me. Joe Davis says That's this program one. is also changing his life. Get it in. He says what makes this program different is the flexibility and support it offers. Me, personally, I got a lot of court dates. I've been having, you know, I, it's hard to keep a job when you got lots of court dates. His job will let you go fast if you always, you know, 
Mick got too many days to miss. I had court almost every day of the month last year, of every month of the year. So it was very nice that I had a program to help me that could de work with me and be flexible. The core offers homeless people a new path, but you have to be willing to do the work. Show up every shift at 7.30 a.m. and work hard. Those that do change their lives. About 70% of the people who come into the core complete the program. Those people who fall out are usually relapsing um, because of addiction. Of the people who complete the program, those 70%, the placement rate for them in jobs runs above 90%. And while it's rare, sometimes when participants drop out, they get a second chance. Justin Perkins did, and now he is spreading the word to try and reach more people. Because that's what we're doing here. We're taking people that were destitute and on the streets and giving them a way out. This program is one of a kind. If you'd like to learn more about the Seattle Conservation Corps, just go to seattle.gov slash parks and search Conservation Corps. And we'll be right back. Welcome back. And we're joined now by Ruth Blau, who is the program manager here of the Seattle Conservation Corps. Thanks for talking with us some more. Thanks for being here. I bet it's really exciting news to have the program represented as a pre-apprenticeship program. And you talked in the story about the need for skilled trade workers. Can you expand on that? What, what's the need here locally? Yeah, so our whole region has had all this growth and there's the light rail projects, there are bridges and huge projects that are funded through the next uh, five to 10 years, and there are not enough workers for those projects. Those are the, the big five, they call them, cement, the pipe trades, electricians, laborers, and uh, the construction trades. And so we have people who are able to get into all of those trades and be put to work immediately, which is fantastic. And I understand the main focus of the core is job skills, but it's really much more than that, correct? Right, so everyone who comes into the core is currently experiencing homelessness, and so they get a wraparound team. They have a case manager, they have someone uh, who helps them with training, and someone who's working on their career development, so that by the end of the year, if they needed their GED, if they had some tests they needed to take, um, getting housing, dealing with other issues, they can get all of that done so that after a year when they leave, they're in really, really good shape to be stable and housed and working. And anyone watching this who's interested in joining the Corps, what would their first step be? So we do a phone screen a couple of times a year, and from the phone screen we build our wait list. We had a phone screen this week. We are currently hiring off of our new wait list, which is 41 people deep. Um, we'll probably get to the end of that wait list at the end of the summer, and then we'll have another phone screen. And I know you have very high success rates. Is it true that if somebody really commits to this one year, are they almost guaranteed a job? Yeah, our placement rate after being in our program for a year is extremely high because they get such good skills, it's really good experience, and the, it, having a year as a city employee on your resume looks great. They are great employees when they leave here. And I imagine you have a lot to choose from, but final question, is there one in particular success story that sticks out you'd like to share? Sure. We had a young woman who came to us with a very long list of challenges that included having her car repoed, some identity theft, she uh, lost custody of her child, and some health challenges. And in the year that she was with us, she just took advantage really of the whole package that the core can offer her and she's now working at a local landscaping company uh, she's doing great she's been there over a year and she has her child back and she's very very happy love to hear it thanks Ruth for talking with us thanks Nicole 
a special scout troop takes the lead for those feeling left behind. That's next on City Street. Seattle Conservation Corps offers job training and assistance, but the real takeaway is opportunity. The same can be said for local Boy Scout Troop 419, allowing some young people the opportunity to experience the joys of scouting. Reporter Brian Callanan and producer Ralph Bevins have the story on the power of participation. Just a little further on and it's all downhill. Ted Cadet is a leader. The kind of guy you'd want on a back roads trail. You know, the weather could have been better, but still nice. A good leader can keep you moving ahead when you're feeling left behind. When I would say that he was a special needs student, I just never got any response. We felt a little bit left out. I called up scout headquarters and uh, was told that no, there's no special needs scouts. Color guard forward march. Okay, okay. If there was no place for a scout like Jaden Kerr, Danny Noonan, right. Patrick Lawrence, or Colin Silvestri, forward march. Forward march. Then is. Ted Cadet would make one. Let's talk here about setting up a tent. Welcome to Boy Scout Troop 419. Good job, Matthew. Go ahead. Let's the only the troop in up. Washington State like this. Designed for special needs scouts. And, oh, and we'll put this one in the Here second grommet. It meets twice okay. a month at the Veterans of Foreign Wars post in Skyway. That's it. In special needs scouting, and there are a number Joey, of differences. Like number one, here. there's no age limit. And we're able to take and modify the requirements to fit the abilities of each scout. Well, you turned out great, Danny. Sandy Noonan and yeah. her son, now? Danny, have been with the group 10 years. <laughs> we are a Boy Scout troop in every sense of the word. Ow! Our scouts, they follow the scout code, they have court of honors, they go to camp, they hike, they do everything every other Boy Scout troop does. Bob Lawrence and his son, Patrick, tried to fit in to a regular troop. 10 to 15 pounds. Yeah, not you. You know, there was transition times and, and things like that when you would go to on a camping trip and everyone would take off and go do something. And sometimes that happened too fast for these guys to make the transition. So we felt a little bit left out. Danny, want to read the advantages? Synthetic fibers are strong. No one so they, is left out here. So they can take Danny out has autism and he fits into this troop perfectly. You know, some of the other scouts do have autism, but there are others with different needs. Now you're going to make yours go the other way. For Kathy and David DeLeon, the troop has been an opportunity to make new friends. To know what the guys are like as a group is to see them joking around. They have made friendships and bonds. Just something that all guys do. They like to hang out and have fun, and that's what they do when they're together. Boy, it's going to be nice to have some hot chocolate and s'mores when we get done with the hike. Ted Cadet right has kept on. Troop 419 on a steady course now for 20 years. There was a point eight or nine years ago when where we, we thought we might have to disband because the whole oh, group of scouts came uh, in at the same time, day. left at the same time. But we went out and found new boys yeah. and uh, adjusted the program to their abilities. Do we like to eat? Like to eat s'mores, yep. Like to eat s'mores, right, okay. By the so way, when Scoutmaster Ted isn't scouting, eat. so look right at the target, he's Dr. Cadet, optometric physician. I would say my biggest challenge has been, it is time consuming, there's gotta be a lot of planning before meetings, make sure we've got all the materials, but um, you make it happen because it's that important to me. Colin, can you put it in the, in the grommet? Yeah, I can get to it. Okay. Of course, this all started as a way of bringing Ted and his son Colin 
closer together. Well, it makes me feel great. What are these? These are uh, sticks. sticks. Most of the projects involve both the parents and the scouts working together, so it certainly has done wonders for building a sense of family. Got it? Yeah. That one I'm especially proud of, because I do a ski. It means a lot to my dad being a scoutmaster and doing what I get to do. I can't really put into words. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag. He just brings complete dedication to the guys learning and growing. And that creates what's called air pressure. The way that he got this troop together and the way that he's kept it going and the way that he has engineered it so that every scout is here having a great time, working to the best of his ability, he's amazing. There you go. <laughs> scouts that are able to speak better, be more active, uh, to just see the growth in the scouts has absolutely been my greatest joy. It's a nice design. It's been a sense of belonging. Cool. Something to be a part of. There you go. And then instead of going back into the My favorite thing to do is hiking. Everything. Troop is nice. The troop makes you proud. They're kind. The troop makes you proud and they're yeah. kind to you. For music? You like the music the best. That's yours, huh? Oh, you could say this troop of scouts marches to a different beat, a different rhythm. But really, like any one of us, all they wanted was a place to belong. And with Ted Cadet's help, they found it. This land was made for you and me. Good job, guys. Troop 419 is always open to new members. To learn more, just go to this link, beascout.scouting.org, and search the zip code 98178. We'll be right back. Well, that's going to wrap up this episode of City Stream from the Seattle Conservation Corps here at Magnuson Park. If you'd like to learn more about the program, just go to seattle.gov parks and search Conservation Corps. I'm Nicole Sanchez. Thanks so much for watching.